everybody. Thank you for coming and braving this cold weather. We do appreciate your presence here tonight. My name is Devin and I'm an adult services librarian. And um, I'm very excited to um, present to you Adrian Miller. He is one of my top favorite presenters. So you guys are in for a real treat. I'd like to thank the friends of the Longmont Library. Without their generous donations of time and money, we would be, I'd be unable to provide these uh, programs for you. So thank you to them as well and to the Longmont Observer. You can find um, their website at longmontobserver.org. They live stream these shows for us. So if you ever can't make one, be sure to um, log into their website and you can check those out there. Um, a few housekeeping things. Please silence your phone tonight. And um, Mr. Miller will be selling books and doing some book signing afterwards. So I will get out of here and let you start. Thanks. All right, thank you. First of all, thanks for all of you to come out tonight and hear about black history in early Colorado. I'm defining early Colorado as pre-1920. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do tonight is just share some um, stories of some of the people that showed up in Colorado. Colorado was blessed to have a lot of incredible African Americans uh, either stay here, live here, or kind of pass through on their way to great things. And um, then just take your questions at the end. So um, first, I want you to know this is very informal, so if you have any questions, just feel free to raise your hand and I'll try to answer them. But I'm gonna start off by telling you my story and how I came to collect these stories of these African Americans. So, um, I was born and raised in Denver, which immediately loses me street cred on the subject of soul food, which is what I'm most known for, right? Um, but the way I win people back is I tell them my parents are from the South. So my mom is from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and my dad is from Helena, Arkansas. So soul food was the food that I grew up eating. So I went to Smoky Hill High School, then I went to Stanford University for undergrad. Um, my major was international relations. Then I went to Georgetown Law School, and I practiced law in Denver for about four years, and I hated it. <laughs> this is not to disparage any attorneys in the audience or people who have attorneys in their families. It just got to the point where I was singing spirituals in my office. So, I'm gonna have to take you on the road with me, laughing at my jokes. Uh, so I just figured I needed to do something else. So I actually was going to open up a soul food restaurant in Denver. If you're familiar with the Denver dining scene, there's a place called Cuba Cuba on 12th and Delaware. So I had the inside track on that spot. I had a chef, I was raising money, and then a friend of mine from Georgetown Law School, not my friend Teresa here, who was at Georgetown the same time as I was, um, called me up and said, hey, I'm working in the Clinton White House. Uh, do you have any friends back in DC who might be interested in this job? And I said, well, tell me about the job. And uh, it was something called the Initiative for One America. If you've never heard of that, don't feel bad. Um, it was something that was started out as the Initiative on Race. And Clinton, uh, President Clinton's initiative on race had this bold and crazy idea. If we just talked to one another and listened, we might realize that we have a lot more in common than what supposedly divides us. I know, crazy, right? So that went on for a year and a half, and then the people running that initiative said, Mr. President, you need to have an ongoing office in the White House dealing with uh, race relations, and that was called the Initiative on One America. So when my, pre when my friend presented this to me, I did the same thing that Dick Cheney did when George W. Bush asked him to find a vice president. I was the head of the search committee, only my name went on the list. <laughs> so I ended up working for President Clinton. Love my time with President Clinton. My only quibble is this. Uh, you probably heard stories where people who meet President Clinton, he makes you feel like you're the only person in the room. I never got that. <laughs> Every time I talked to him, it was just like a blank look. I'd say, Mr. President, blank look. Kind of like the one you're giving me right now. Um, Adrian Miller, blank look. I work in your one American issue. And he said, oh, that's great. <laughs> 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 then a woman would walk by and he'd call her out by name. And I'm like, ah. Oh. <laughs> so I uh, really enjoyed my time here in the White House. Uh, but at that time of my life, my ambition was to be the senator from Colorado. So, but I loved DC, so I was going back and forth on whether or not to stay in DC. So I talked to some really key insiders in DC and asked them, you know, what, should I stay here or go back to Colorado? And they said, look, you're really nice, so if you stay here, <laughs> you're only going to get so far. So you should go back to Colorado. And Colorado's not a bad place to be from. I agree with them. Um, but at that time, the job market was really, really slow. So um, I hate to admit this, I was watching a lot of daytime television. I hope you can forgive me for that. I, I'm not going to tell you the shows. Uh, and so. It got to the point where I said, I guess I should read something. So I went to the bookstore, and I'm browsing the bookshelves, and I see this book on the history of Southern food. Uh, and that was written by a guy named John Edgerton, and the book was called Southern Food at Home on the Road in History. And in that book, he wrote that the tribute to African-American achievement in cookery had yet to be written. 
I thought that was really interesting. So I just emailed him because the book was about 10 years old at that point. And I asked him, you know, somebody's written this in the interim, right? And he said, no, you know, nobody's really taken on the full story. So with no qualifications at all, except for eating a lot of soul food and cooking it some, I decided to dive in and research that story. So in the research process for that book, I read about 3,000 oral histories of formerly enslaved people um, and looked for all references for food. I read about 500 cookbooks. But the real treasure trove of information was the thousands of newspaper articles that I read. There are companies that now digitize these sources and they're word searchable. So I looked through those, but then because I'm just hardcore, I decided to go to the library and just look through the black newspapers in the Denver Public Library. And we have an incredible resource there. So there were three or four black newspapers dating back from 1890, going all the way up to 1950s. And now there are gaps in those newspapers, but I actually just printed out any reference for food or something that I thought was interesting. I, as I would go through those microfilms, I would actually download the articles and print them out. And you're gonna see clips of them um, tonight, but I don't have any here with them. But you'll, you'll, you'll be able to tell that it was from an actual newspaper. And that's where I started to see this rich history. Because it's not the history that you normally get in public school. And I, I learned that all of these people kind of, uh, about all these people that showed up in Denver. And then the other footnote I, I want to add is, on the soul food research, because I care about my subjects so much, I decided I needed to eat my way through the country. <laughs> so I went to 150 soul food restaurants in 35 cities and 15 states. So if you are my Facebook friend, I brought you along for the journey because I would take a picture of the restaurant exterior and then the plate of food that I was eating. Um, and then while I was researching that book, I found out about African Americans who had cooked for our presidents. And that led to my second book on the, called The President's Kitchen Cabinet, which is a history of African American presidential chefs. Um, based on my own research, I've identified 150 people who have cooked uh, in the presidential kitchen from George Washington all the way to Donald Trump. So that's kind of the, those, the, those are the books that I've read. But tonight we're gonna talk about these African Americans in, our, oh, here we go, here's a clicker. So um, this first picture that I have is actually a picture that's in the Denver Public Library collection. It's a group of African American cyclists taken around eight, 1900. So these are just people dressed up and out for the town. And I just thought it's a cool, cool picture. So the first person I want to talk about is a guy named Jim Beckworth. If you know about Colorado history, you probably have heard of this guy. This guy was uh, a famous. So he starts out as a trapper, and he actually comes to the Rocky Mountain region about 1826. Um, he's a well-known trapper all throughout the Rocky Mountain region, um, and he starts to develop some fame as a trapper, hunter, and a man of kind of bravery. And the interesting story about him is he gets adopted by a tribe of Crow Indians. And he not only becomes embraced with this tribe, he actually ends up marrying one of the Native American women from that tribe, and he becomes a chief in that tribe. Um, but he's well known throughout the Rocky Mountain region, um, especially as more and more settlers come out. Um, a sad note for him that's really changed his stay in Colorado is he actually was the guide that led troops to what was uh, to the site of what is now known as the Sand Creek Massacre, where 100, 500 um, innocent men, women, and children were slaughtered. And that so revolted him that he left Colorado um, and relocated to Montana. Um, there are, there's some controversy about his death. Some sources say that he died of natural causes. There are other sources that say he was invited to a feast by the Crow Indians and was poisoned um, at that feast. And the reason why he was poisoned, so the story goes, is that uh, the Crow Indian tribe wanted him to be their chief. And he refused to do so. You know, he just wanted to live another life. And they felt that if they poisoned him, they could capture his essence and spirit. Mm -hmm. He was at that feast. So, you know, there's two different stories about him. But Jim Beckworth is one of the earliest African Americans who shows up uh, in Colorado. Uh, next person is I want to talk about is Clara Brown. Um, Clara Brown was um, formerly enslaved. Uh, she ends up coming out to Colorado. And um, she originally lands in kind of the central city area, and she starts a laundry business. And so she's one of the first African-American women in this uh, territory, and then she was an entrepreneur. So she creates this laundry business and actually becomes quite wealthy. Uh, and she would actually go and visit miners up in the mountains. Not only was she a laundress, but she would also cook meals, um, help, you know, she was kind of a helper, and she would tend to the sick. And so she generated so much goodwill that by the end of her life, when she had spent her fortune, because she was so generous that she actually spent a lot of her money, that people in turn took care of her and um, helped her out in the latter years of her life. So she's well known in the central city 
area. Um, she also spent some time in Denver. Has anybody here been to the new African American History Museum in, in Washington, D.C.? Did you see the Clara Brown? You've been there? Did you see the Clara Brown exhibit? Okay, so she's actually uh, represented in that museum two times, and there's a nice bust of her in that museum. So it just shows you kind of how notable uh, she was as a person. Uh, Julie, Julia Greeley. Do I have any Catholics in the audience? Do you know the story about Julia Greeley? Okay, if you don't know about Julia Greeley, so she, again, a uh, formerly enslaved person um, from St. <coughs> Louis, and um, early in her life, she was owned by a very cruel slave master who was beating her mother, and um, while he was whipping her mother, he, the whip caught her right eye and blinded her, so she was blinded in one eye. But um, after the Emancipation Act in, Miss, in Missouri, she makes her way to Colorado, and she quickly becomes a well-known figure in Denver for her charitable um, efforts. So um, not to bring shame to the poor and the infirm, she would actually go around Denver out dark alleys at night and help the sick. And um, her contributions are so well noted that now the, cap the Archdiocese of Denver has put her through the canonization process. So um, because of that, I guess one of the steps that happens with that process is that her remains were removed from the cemetery they were in, and now they're buried in the, um, in the cathedral uh, in central Denver. Um, so I did not even know about her until I read about her in, my, um, in a newspaper. And I forgot to mention this. My day job is I run the Colorado Council of Churches, which is a uh, Christian organization that represents 13 Christian denominations. And the idea is to get Christians to know each other across denominational lines and do social justice work. If you've never heard of us, we're the ones who do the Easter sunrise service at Red Rocks. So I've emceed that for the last five years. When it doesn't snow. <laughs> Two years ago it snowed, and I got such a hard time about that. There was so much snow in the venue that, you know, even if we had, were able to shovel it, we, there's no place to put it. And people uh, sent me emails saying, Brother Miller, if you just had more faith, <laughs> don't you know we could move mountains of snow? <laughs> Nobody wanted to show their good works by showing up with shovels, right? Um, and even the atheists gave me a hard time, and I thought they would say congratulations. So. <laughs> So it was during my work with the Colorado Council of Churches that I heard the story about Julia. Um, what I haven't really figured out is what was her requisite miracle. Because there has to be a miracle to take place to start you know, the process to sainthood. And I, I can't remember exactly what that is. I looked through my materials and I, it didn't, I didn't see it there. But it must have been something involving healing the sick. Because that's what she was most known for doing. Um, she ends up in Denver. And Claire, Clara Martin and um, Julia Gre Greeley uh, die around 1900. So early... Um, part of the 20th century. Buffalo Soldiers. So um, you may not know this, but the Buffalo Soldiers were a several uh, army regiments of African Americans, and they had played a big role two ways in the West. Um, one is that they were a strong military presence in the West and often were involved in the uh, battles with Native Americans. Um, they were called Buffalo Soldiers because the, the story goes is that the Native Americans seen the hair that African Americans had thought it represented, uh, was uh, reminiscent of the wool on buffaloes. So that's where that nickname comes from. But um, buffalo soldiers were all throughout the West um, from Arizona up to Montana. And the interesting thing, and we have this uh, gentleman pictured here in a, on a horse in a, in a, at a fort in South Col uh, Southern Colorado. But a lot of the buffalo soldiers were actually bicycle regiments. So they had huge bicycles and that's, a lot of them traversed the West on bicycles, which made a lot of sense on the Great Plains, right? So I just thought that was really, I couldn't find a picture of one on a bicycle, but I just thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. So I'm, what I'm gonna do now is just give you some profiles of people through different categories. And just to presage the ending, so you'll stay awake until the ending, um, you know, I, I forgot to mention, I'm also a certified barbecue judge, which is a great story if you wanna ask me about that in the Q&A. So we're gonna end with the profile of one of the most famous barbecue guys in the late 1800s. But first in business, it, one of the most notable people was a guy named Barney Ford. Barney Ford, um, again, was a, a biracial man, but formerly enslaved. He winds up in Colorado in kind of the 1860s, and he lands in Breckenridge, actually, and was involved in mining and speculation, and actually amassed a quick fortune in Breckenridge. In fact, if you go to Breckenridge, you'll see, this is a drawing of his house, but his house is a museum there now. Um, but the whites were very, in that area, were very resentful, and so basically he was forced to flee Breckenridge and come to Denver. But in Denver, he becomes a very prominent businessman. Um, one of his first businesses was Ford's People's Restaurant. 
And so that restaurant still exists to this day. It was an Indian uh, restaurant for a little while, but I think it's changed hands. But that is basically the same facade that it had in the 1860s when that business was created. And on the other side, I don't know if you can see it, but that's basically an ad for his um, restaurant, showing the, you know, offering the very finest things in, um, at his restaurant. Another, and it was on, yeah, it's on Blake Street. So it's on 19th and Blake. It's just the, um, kind of like the 1900 block of Blake Street. Um, I think right across the street would be the Cactus, uh, the Rio uh, restaurant. It's a Mexican restaurant. Um, for those of you who like your margaritas with Everclear, you probably know that spot. <laughs> <laughs> so it's right across the street from that. Um, but he was also known for his hotels. So one of his magnificent hotels was called the uh, Ford Inner Ocean Hotel. So that's a look at his hotel again in the 1860s, which was uh, in downtown Denver. And he also had another hotel, very similar in Cheyenne, Wyoming. He ends up losing both of these hotels um, because of the silver bust in the 1890s and other things. But um, essentially, this guy was a next level businessman. And um, here is a article, this is a letter to the editor to the Chicago Inner Ocean newspaper. And um, the following is from the editors of it, and then they have a letter from Barney Ford, which I want to read for you now. So they say the following pointed letter shows two things. First, that the Inner Ocean Hotel is appreciated, or the newspaper is appreciated by the race whose cause it defended, because the Inner Ocean was a black newspaper. And second, that the intelligent and active colored men are pushing themselves to, to the front in a way that must win for them the respect of all men whose good opinion is worth having. So then they have a letter from Barney Ford dated April 12, 1877. And it says, letter to the editor. I have just completed the finest hotel between San Francisco and Omaha, a building boasting about $75,000. And I have named it after the Chicago Inner Ocean. So he named his hotels after this newspaper. You will not be surprised at this when I tell you how thankful I am to you for its magnificent political course for the last two years. And when I further tell you that I am a colored man, but in a country where, thank God, I have my rights and liberty, and where, if I am worthy, I am respected by all classes of citizens. The far west is the place for the colored man. Here he stands for what he is worth. Here he can occupy any position for which nature and education have fitted him. Thanks to you, liberty-loving, brave old inner ocean, for the fight you have made for us. Yours truly, B.L. Ford. So Colorado, in many sense, was just seen as a, not a utopia, but a land of opportunity, a true opportunity where African Americans could have progress. Because in many parts of the country, what you'll see in our history is that black progress may flourish, but it's often thwarted by whites in that area. A lot of times, if a, a black uh, entrepreneur had a successful business, whites would burn it down, they would run that person out of town, um, destroy the business, or make very, life very difficult. So Colorado was definitely a place where people could see um, economic opportunity. And I think that's why it was a magnet for so many. So if you go to the state capitol today, and if you're in the House of Representatives, and you look at the stained glass window on the west side of that building, this is what you're going to see. Stained glass of Barney Ford. Because he also served in our state legislature in the 1890s. Um, he dies in 1902, and um, right around 1902, and he's buried in a cemetery in Denver, Colorado. But um, just a fascinating character. Madam C.J. Walker. Do you all know about Madam C.J. Walker? So um, you may not know this, but she spent some time in Denver, and this is actually where she got her start, so to say, so to speak. So she was in another uh, city, but she um, ends up working for a mail order business that sells beauty products, and so they assign her to come to Denver. So she's in Denver, and she gets married to a guy named Charles Walker, and that's where the C.J. Walker comes from. And um, shortly <laughs> while she's in Denver, she invents a hair growing product, which makes her extremely wealthy. And this is one of the ads that she had for her product. So that's her in the middle, and after using this product, that's how it's a hair growth that she got. <laughs> so you can see why this would be very effective, right? To people in the 1890s, right? Looking at this. So um, she starts selling this um, product, and she becomes so successful that she actually only spends a few years in Denver. She actually gets divorced from the C.J. Walker guy while she's in Denver, but she keeps the name, and she ends up moving to Indianapolis. So this is an early example of her business in Indianapolis, and then she becomes fabulously wealthy, right? So this is her in New York, driving around with the gals, <laughs> and this is her house. 
Villa Lawaro. Now, the reason why it's called Lawaro is it's the first three initials from her daughter's name. She just kind of combined them. But this is in upstate New York, um, Irvington, New York, to be specifically, to be specific. So a palatial uh, residence. So she was Oprah before Oprah was Oprah, okay? Um, the first self-made millionaire, African-American um, millionaire um, woman to be a, a millionaire. And she spent some time in Denver. Okay, entertainment. Um, does anybody know the Oscar winner that we've had in Colorado? Don Cheadle. Uh, oh, or uh, Don Cheadle. Okay, yes, yes. But before 19, you know, that made that spent some time in Colorado before 1920. Oh, thank you. Addie McDaniel, who won the uh, Oscar, right? Best Supporting Actress. So her family is from Kansas, but they end up moving to Fort Collins in 1910. And her family was a, uh, a, basically a group of vaudeville entertainers. So they traveled a lot from place to place, but they wind up in Fort Collins. In fact, in Fort Collins, her house uh, was de dedicated. So it's now a uh, tourist attraction. It um, was dedicated a couple years ago. 20, 2016, they dedicated her house. So she's in Fort Collins, but only for a short period of time. And then they moved to Denver. She ends up going to East High School. And... Um, She's in East High School, but she, and she graduates, but she's kind of in and out because of the demands of the family, the entertaining and the travel and other things. Sometimes she takes stretches where she's not in school. But she ends up going to East, and um, she takes on a few jobs, odds and, odds and ends. Sometimes she's a laundress, sometimes she's a servant, and other times she's a cook in a restaurant. And all of that prepared her for her Oscar-winning um, role in Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind. Yep. Okay, Law. Um, Denver had a lot of interesting lawyers that show up. Um, the guy that I want to highlight is Joseph H. Stewart. So Joseph H. Stewart is actually from the British West Indies, um, from Bermuda, and he ends up in Colorado in the 1870s, and he ends up practicing law, um, and he was well known as a trial attorney. This is how skilled he was as a trial attorney. In the early 1900s, he actually, in a jury trial, Exon got exonerated an African-American man accused of killing a white police officer. He did that in the early 1900s. The other thing that's so fascinating about this guy is that in 1895, just as segregation is um, becoming more uh, entrenched in our society, he, he was a member of the state legislature. He actually pushes through legislation that was an anti-discrimination bill. And if you look at the bare bones of that, um, language of what he passed and got passed in 1895, it is essentially the same as the 1964 Civil Rights Act. It allowed African Americans to have access to public accommodations and other things. This is the 1890s in Colorado, this guy gets this done. Um, he has an untimely death, he dies at the age of 50, unfortunately, so he's not around as long as uh, we had hoped, but um, here's an, uh, an, a newspaper ad uh, advertisement that is in the um, Colorado Republican, which was a black newspaper at that time. This is 1906. So he's right on Kittredge. So if you all know um, the 16th Street Mall, do you know where the Paramount Cafe is? It's essentially that office building. And that office building eventually would get other lawyers. And so the, fir the earliest known African-American law firm west of the Mississippi is in Denver in the 1910s and the 1920s. For those of you who know the um, African-American legal scene in Denver, the Black Bar Association is named after Sam Carey. It's called the Sam Carey Bar Association. For a long time, people thought that Sam Carey was the actual first uh, African-American to pass the bar in the state, but he, there were several more um, before him. Joseph Stewart wasn't even the first one. It was a guy named Edwin Hackley, who was a member of the, uh, who graduated from the University of Michigan, who actually shows up in 1881. He's the first African-American who passed the bar in Colorado. Uh, if you've never heard of Ac uh, Edwin Hackley, his wife actually was a famous opera singer. You may have heard of his wife, um, Ophelia Hackley, um, who um, was well known around the world. But um, Sam Carey became the kind of the, uh, the name associated with the bar associated because of what he went through in the 1920s. He was a, sexful, a successful trial attorney, but in the 1920s, the Klan was very, very um, entrenched here in Colorado government. And he ends up getting disbarred, and a lot of people fell for unjust reasons. So just a symbol of what he went through in that time period and his legal skills is that's why the Bar Association is named after him <coughs> instead of some others. Medicine. Um, one of the earliest African-American doctors is this woman, Dr. Justina Ford. 
Her residence and office was on 20th and Arapahoe in Denver. So that part of Denver was a black area. Um, in fact, a lot of Denver um, were African-American areas which you wouldn't know today. For instance, Cherry Creek, that was an African-American area known as Cowtown before people, the whites started moving in and buying property and things. Also City Park, part of the land for City Park was donated from two African-American farms. So that just shows you kind of how um, African-Americans were dispersed in that city. Um, here's a look at her uh, ad in the black newspaper so you can see um, her hours and everything. So again, just to, to show you that even for an African-American woman was a, a lot of opportunity available in Colorado, in Denver. Yes? No, I thought, I thought there might be some connection. I haven't found it yet. It's entirely possible. I just haven't seen it yet. Now, I have to say that I haven't done the gene genealogical research, but I actually thought about that as I was pulling this together. Yeah, yeah. and I, it would make sense if that was the case. Yeah. Um, this is again a guy named Henry O. Wagner. Um, and again, another formerly enslaved person who first goes to Chicago, but eventually he does, I'm sorry, I just, I told you I was going to stay between the microphones, I didn't do that. Um, he first shows up in Chicago, but then makes his way to Denver. And the thing that was interesting about Henry O. Wagner is he was um, a, on the forefront of civil rights. So when Colorado is consider considering <coughs> statehood in 1876, he gathers up a, a, a group of African American men and they petition Congress not to allow Colorado to become a state until African American men get the right to vote. And they were successful in doing that. Yeah. Now they're a little behind the times. They didn't have the sisters voting yet, but um, they got the African American men in there. And so, in the newspaper at the time, they have not only the petition, but they have the, the signature or the you know the names of everybody who signed that petition. And this guy was one of the people that really was on the forefront of that. Now think about this. This is in the 1870s. Okay, that this kind of thing happens. Religion. Um, I couldn't find a lot about pastors, so I thought I would just show you the oldest. African American church in Denver. This is the oldest church west of the Mississippi. And this church was founded in the 1860s in Denver. So it's the oldest, I'm sorry, the oldest black church west of the Mississippi. So this is Zion Baptist Church, which still exists to this day. Um, it's in the Five Points area of Denver. My church, Campbell Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church, is in that same neighborhood. The interesting thing about the neighborhood is now it's gentrifying. So it's, um, the neighborhood is about a third, a third, third white African-American Latino. Uh, but those the Latino and um, African-American numbers are dwindling. Um, I knew that the neighborhood was changing once we, I saw a dog park was being installed. Because <laughs> uh, for African-Americans, our dog park is the backyard, right? Okay. <laughs> restaurants, okay, you know this is dear in my heart, so I'll just go through the restaurants. So the earliest ad um, that I could find for restaurants were like the Rhine Cafe in 1907. There is an ad for a boarding house in 1882, um, run by a Mrs. Benjamin. But you can see from this ad that there was really an emphasis on fine dining. So it's not typically the food that we associate with soul food necessarily, but this real strong emphasis on fine dining. Um, another thing that I thought was, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I mixed up the slide. So here's Mrs. Benjamin in 1882. And it wasn't uncommon for a boarding house to offer meals, and so it would be part a restaurant, partly a hotel. At all hours. Yeah, at all hours. <laughs> Comfortable rooms. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought this was really cool. So in a lot of the black newspapers, the restaurant would actually print the menu for the night. So I thought that was pretty handy. And so look at this menu. Again, uh, a lot of southern specialties, but again, you know, a lot of things that you wouldn't expect necessarily at a soul food place. Now, this seems more like a comfort food place, because you got mac and cheese, you got chow chow, you all know what chow chow is? It's a, it's a kind of a pickled relish out of the south, cabbage and other things. Um, and, uh, oh I'm sorry, I thought I saw a hand back there. Uh, roast spring chicken, prime rib, I mean look at that spread. I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty impressive. So that's 1906. Um, the next thing I wanna tell you about, just in terms of just kind of uh, business is O.T. Jackson. So O.T. Jackson, arrives in Denver in the, um, to Colorado in the 18, early 1880s, um, but not to Denver. He arrives in Boulder, and he was known, he was, he was a very well-known caterer. So he would cater events throughout Boulder as well as in mining towns and other places. So this is an actual menu in the Denver Public Library collection. So you can see on one side, let's just get a look at this. 
I, I'm fascinated by kind of the, uh, let's see if this is a light, oh, anyway. I'm fascinated by kind of the ribbons here that are on the inside. But you can see the kind of the, the menu, how elaborate it is. And then we have on the bottom, O.T. Jackson as the caterer. But again, some mix of Southern food and other fine dining. So he starts out as a caterer, and this is his um, wedding announcement. I call it Jackson's United, but this is just uh, his wedding announcement in the paper to his wife. And after they get married uh, in the 1890s, they dream up Deerfield. So Deerfield is probably one of the most well-known black settlements in Colorado. It was on the border between um, Weld County and Morgan County. And what would happen is um, a lot of African Americans migrate from the South, but they don't come directly to Colorado. Most African Americans went to the Middle West. So Indiana, Kansas was a huge landing place for a lot of people, the town of Nicodemus and other places. But eventually African Americans kept moving West and Deerfield was one of the places that was advertised. So Otis Jackson created, O.T. Jackson created these uh, advertisements, like the town of Deerfield, uh, talking about the opportunity. Here's a group photo, so you can get kind of an idea of the people who were in that town. Um, this shows you the black settlements that were either started or proposed in Colorado. So I don't want you to think that Deerfield was the only place. Um, most African Americans that migrate to Colorado between 1860 and 1900 go to Denver, Colorado Springs, and Pueblo. But we see that there was some, there was a thriving colony in, outside of Cortez, Colorado. You can see that in the, in the lower corner there. Um, there were some outside of Pueblo and a few other places. But Deerfield was probably the one that had the most notoriety. So here's a, a look at life in Deerfield. The lunchroom and the gas station. So uh, Deerfield is doing quite well by the time we get to the late 1910s because World War I created a huge demand for food. In fact, a lot of American farmers were exporting food to Europe. So it was doing very well in the 1910s, but then the 1920s, things go south. Uh, corn prices drop, as well as a lot of other agricultural prices, and then we get the Dust Bowl that emerges. And because of that one-two punch, Deerfield slowly starts to die in the 1920s and 30s. There are people that stay there to the 1950s, but ultimately, it becomes a ghost town. So this is what Deerfield looks like today. Um, it has been registered on the site of National Historic Places, but um, as of now, no one's really put in any money to kind of restore these buildings and make it more of a tourist site. But that's what it looks like now. But it was one of the um, gleaming examples of a successful black settlement for at least about 20 years. Uh, so if those things hadn't happened, it probably would still be a thriving city I don't know about today because of the changes in farming, but it would have lasted a lot longer. Um, there are actually some people in my church who are descended from people who lived in Deerfield uh, because they grew up in Greeley, but no one really uh, lives there now. Okay, so this is my favorite character, Columbus B. Hill. So Columbus B. Hill was a famous barbecue man. So he comes to Denver um, in the 1870s from Missouri. And in short order, he's doing some of the largest barbecues in Colorado history. <coughs> Excuse me, in Colorado history. So, in July, on July 4th, 1890, he does a barbecue when the cornerstone is laid for the uh, state capitol building. 30,000 people show up for this barbecue. <laughs> so now, if you've been to the state capitol, we're talking about Lincoln Park. Lincoln Park and that park across the street, right? 30,000 people descend there. Um, according to the newspapers, there was not a spot of extra food to be found. There was just a lemon peel here and there from the lemonade. <laughs> That's what they say. Uh, so he's doing the barbecue at, at the state capitol. Here is um, a barbecue at what was called Greeley Potato Days. Have you ever heard of that? So in the, night, uh, in the much of the 19th uh, or the 20th century, uh, Colorado had a lot of food festivals. So towns that were a part of an agricultural community they would show off at the harvest. So probably you, the most exa famous example is probably Rocky Ford and the melons. Okay, so we would have strawberry days in Steamboat Springs. We would have the cantaloupe days in the watermelon days and really had its potato days. So Hill is in the middle there. And this is really interesting. In the 1890s, the African-American man has an all white staff kind of making this barbecue. And so the barbecue menu there was that they actually had lamb barbecue. So it was lamb, white bread and coffee. That was the menu. And then some baked potatoes. There's a guy in the lower right-hand corner. 
he's digging a, a hole to roast uh, baked potatoes. And so what they would do often in this method of barbecue making is you would dig a trench and then you would get your f fuel source, whatever kind of wood you were gonna use, you would put that in there and you would burn it and let it burn down to coals. And then you would wrap, you would either wrap the meat and put it on the coals or you would um, essentially put a grate over that fuel source and then kind of butterfly whatever meat you were gonna cook. So he was doing this, and on the regular, they would get 10,000 people for these lamb barbecues. <laughs> but the most famous barbecue, notorious barbecue, was the Stock Show of 1898. So much like today, the Stock Show was not guaranteed to be in Denver. So the Denver Meat Growers Association decided to have a huge barbecue, but a VIP barbecue, only for 5,000 people, okay? VIP. And the idea was that they were going to be so impressed, you know, the, the, the people who were organizing the stock show would be so impressed that Denver would become the permanent home. So Columbus B. Hill, who was the noted barbecuer of the time, was asked to be in charge of this feast. So these are just the people watching the preparations for the barbecue. So the Denver Republican newspaper had a sketch artist um, just kind of observe the whole scene. So you see the massive kind of shed in the middle, and that's where all the cooking was taking place. And these are all the people waiting for it. So here's the look at the menu, all right? So according to newspaper reports at the time, there were 200 beeves, so 200 cows, possum, chicken, and all of this game, and you know, just all kinds of meat. I, I think like 500 pigs, just a lot of meat was being cooked. And again, you're thinking about uh, feeding 5,000 people. So it gets to the point where this barbecue is about to happen, and um, unfortunately, word got out to Lodo about the barbecue, and at that time, Lodo was the seedy part of town. I don't know what you think about Lodo today, but back then it was the seedy part of town. And so 25,000 people showed up for this barbecue for 5,000, which created a quite a problem. And people were getting restless, and somebody got the idea that, hey, why don't we just give out beer from Zang Brewery to mollify the crowd, right? And that made people even more amps. So what happened is that there was such a frenzy that people, once they've sensed that the barbecue is ready, they just bum rush the cooking area, and all of a sudden, you get this scene. People just fighting, women and children weeping, food everywhere. The governor of Colorado and the mayor of Denver attended this event, and they were there to try to chill people out, so they got up on a platform and they were telling people to be orderly, and people just started throwing food at them. So they were booed off the stage. This is the scene that the sketch artist wrote. And I love the guy in the right-hand corner. He's serenely eating his sandwich <laughs> while there's this melee around him. So Columbus Hill never really lived this one down. Uh, days after this report, there were editorial cartoons of him trying to sleep, but the scene was playing in his dreams and other things like that. His reputation was rehabilitated eventually, but to me, this was the wildest stock show ever. It may be the wildest barbecue in U.S. history, and he was right in the middle of it. So even after this, he's doing barbecues um, for a lot of the big events in Denver until he dies in 1920. Um, in 1906, he actually does a barbecue for my church, Campbell Chapel AME Church, and he's actually interviewed while he's cooking. And the thing that I loved is he makes a theological argument for, or framing for barbecue. He basically says that it descended from the temples of Moses as people were doing their burnt offerings. You know, and he just like really flowery language. So I just love that guy. Um, so just a very interesting character. So um, you know, I've given you a, a snippet of people that uh, show up in Colorado. But the thing to understand is that at that time, because we had the right political climate and the, the opportunity, it was a magnet for a lot of African Americans. So we had white Americans here in Colorado that did not mind black progress and did not create a lot of barriers. Now I'm not saying there wasn't racism because we had the Klan and other things, but we had enough preconditions here where African American entrepreneurs, artists, and other people could thrive. And I think that made Colorado very special compared to maybe other states that surround us. And I think that's what attracted so many African Americans here. So um, that's why I call this Black Gold. At one point, I was interested in writing a book about this uh, because I have, seriously, hundreds of articles about these people. And I'm actually thinking about um, delving more into the story, maybe finding if there are descendants to give those um, family stories. So um, have to do that. Have to do that? Do you, do you think there would be a market for that? Yes. <laughs> okay, all right. Because, you know, when I propose books to commercial publishers, they usually say no. 
In fact, I tell my friends, if I'm ever feeling too good about myself, I'll just submit a proposal to a commercial publisher. Uh, it, yeah, yeah. But um, I think it's a rich story, and it just hasn't been told. There have been some books about uh, the Black West, um, but it's lumped all the states together. Nobody's really focused in on Colorado. And um, I just think we were a land of opportunity. So thank you so much. And I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Well, so I'm working on another book. So my next book is going to be on um, African American barbecue culture because um, I don't know if you consume a lot of food media, but there are um, several shows on TV. And, you know, like for instance, I watched an hour long show on a network associated with food. And yeah, I don't want to name it. <laughs> I'm glad you got that. Um, it was an hour long special on Southern barbecue, right? Not Scandinavian barbecue, Southern barbecue. <laughs> Did not talk to one African American. <coughs> on oh my gosh. Now there, there were black people doing the work in the background, but none were interviewed. And to me, that's just messed up because if you know anything about barbecue, African Americans are central to the American barbecue story, not a side story. Um, also, another tidbit: Do you all know that there is an African? Uh, there's a barbecue hall of fame in Kansas City. <laughs> They've had 24 inductees. How many do you think are African American? Oh, okay, it's not that bad. Almost though. All right. One, the one um, inductee is a guy named Henry Perry, who is the acknowledged father of Kansas City Barbecue, so he should be in there, but there are no others. And I can think of at least 10 that should be in there. You know who's in the Barbecue Hall of Fame besides all of these classic African-American pitmasters? Henry Ford. <laughs> now, Henry Ford is in there, because I don't know if you know this, but his early cars were made out of wood. So charcoal briquettes are actually a byproduct of the car making process. So King's Ford, charcoal, that's a nod to Henry Ford. Um, the other person, Guy Fieri. <laughs> yeah, I know. Who's known for eating barbecue. I don't think he's known for cooking it. So, um, so I want to write that book next. The tentative title for that book is Black Smoke. And um, so I'm excited about that. So after I write that book, then maybe I can do this one. I might even call it Black Gold. I like that title. So thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. So immediately, post Civil War, and people were just sick of 620 some thousand dead, and God only knows how many maimed amputees returning to civilian life. You know, that's a, that's an interesting thesis. I hadn't thought about it that way. I, the way I look at it is, Colorado never officially legalized slavery. So there's something in the mix that that didn't happen. So I think that has a lot to do with it. I mean, there were certainly people that had enslaved people here. And I think it was just kind of, you know, overlooked by local enforcement. But that's interesting. I'll have to think about that. Because, yeah, 17, 1870s. So people start showing up late, you know, they, they call it the gold rush of 1859. So the question to me is why did people, the people that landed in Colorado, why didn't they go to California? Um, you know, because that was a huge gold rush as well as seen as a land of opportunity. Maybe it was just more, it was more um, economical to stop here in Colorado. Um, but I hadn't thought about that, so it's interesting. I'll have to thank you. What year was the um, handcart disaster of the immigrants pushing to Utah in the dead of winter? So I don't know that story. Oh, I don't, the handcart. Does anybody know this? The handcart disaster. Do you know what year that was? Was it was it after 1859? I think so. Really? Um, no. People were brought over from Europe and persuaded that they could walk to Utah from the Mississippi River, pushing all their things in a hand. Oh man, not even a wagon? No, no. That is messed up. This was a fresh release system for uh -huh. population no. in Europe and how to populate Mormon lands on the cheap. Okay, so did people just, because that's a long walk, they just they just stopped before the hills got too high? I'm wondering if they got wind that a lot of people didn't make it and froze to death. Oh wow, okay. Yeah, I, I didn't know about that. Yeah. It's 1856. 1856, so is this before the gold rush here? Okay. And a lot of Southerners uh, arrive in Colorado. I mean, many attribute the founding of Denver to the Georgians who came here because there was actually a mining tradition for gold in Georgia. Um, and, some, and many think that's why a lot of Georgians actually wind up here in Colorado. Cherokee land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. I don't know. Any other questions? Uh, I'll tell you guys. Oh, they've been here. What, um, was there much mixing 
in terms of um, intermarriage between the African American settlers and the Native Americans who were already here? Yes. So, yeah. In fact, it's kind of a long-running joke with a lot of Amer African American families, like especially out west in, in certain parts of the country. If you look back far enough, you'll, you'll definitely have some um, Native American heritage. So, for instance, my godmother is part uh, Choctaw Indian. And a woman in my church, she's also got um, Native American heritage. So there was intermixing. And there's a fascinating story behind that because for um, a lot of people in the country, uh, for you know, enslaved people, if they made it to Indian territory, they were free. And so a lot of people, that was the goal, was to get to Indian lands because they couldn't be retrieved by you know, fugitive slave catchers. So, um, so you start finding. So one of the things that's uh, kind of an interesting controversy right now is whether or not these African American descendants of people who escaped long ago, whether they really have Indian status in their tribes if they intermarry. So that's that's something that's going on with a lot of tribes, and I think part of it may be related to doling out casino, getting a share of casino money. I think that drives a lot of that. But um, yeah, that's a that's another fascinating story. Mm -hmm. Most of the people that wind up in um, Colorado are from the very edge of the South. Um, so like Texas, if you consider Texas the South, but like Texas, Oklahoma, and again, kind of maybe like Louisiana and all those places, they, they kind of come here first. And in terms of just general migration patterns, if people lived along the eastern seaboard, they pretty much headed north. So DC, Philadelphia, New York, Boston. If they were in the middle south, they kind of went to the great middle cities, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, Milwaukee. But then on the far west, people tended to kind of just hug the coastline. So a lot of people, African Americans who left the far west or San Francisco, Louisiana, or Louisiana, Los Angeles, um, and other parts who were from Louisiana, Texas, and things like that. I think our Texas influence is why um, we have a lot of Texas customs here in Colorado. And you see that play out with food especially. But Juneteenth, which is an emancipation celebration that started in Texas, I think Denver has maybe the second largest one outside of Texas. So it's interesting to kind of follow these migration patterns and see where railroads went and where people tended to live. <laughs> yeah. East Texas was part of the South. West yeah. Texas. Yeah, East Texas, yeah, part of the South. In fact, in terms of barbecue, it's interesting you say that, because like, right now in terms of barbecue, there's a lot of attention on Central Texas barbecue, but I think East Texas is very different. Um, and it has more of an African-American style, I think. Um, yes, I'm sorry, you had a question. <laughs> oh, um, I was trying to figure out if the uh, doctor that you showed the picture to is an like early obstetrician in yeah. Denver, mm -hmm. so that, I mean, I was, teaching with Thelma Gash, who said she was one of the daughters, one of Get the babies of, of that oh, wow. obstetrician. Oh, nice. So yes, yes. That was her practice. Yeah. Okay. okay. Oh, wow. What a connection. Is her daughter still alive? Um, Thelma Gash, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, but she, she wasn't the daughter. She was one of the babies of that obstetrician. Oh, that was delivered. Say. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Here and then here. And then my other question related to that of what research you might have done or what you might have found about um, individual black cowboys. Yeah, so I did not see a reference to that. Um, so that's interesting to me. I just saw the reference to Buffalo Soldier. But I, I, could see the, uh, I could see that because, again, a lot of these African-American soldiers were fighting with whites in these, you know, these battles against anybody. So I could see that being a derogatory term. In terms of the individual cowboys, uh, you know, certainly like Bill Pickett. Um, there was another guy, and I can't remember his name. He's the one that discovered the Folsom fossil site. Um, and I can't, I just can't remember his name. Um, but yeah, a lot of black cowboys um, were here. And um, some of them eventually became quite wealthy. Um, one of the things I didn't mention here is uh, there were a lot of articles written about wealthy Negroes during the 1890s, and they picked several people from Denver. Like Barney Ford, he was worth $250,000 uh, $250, at one point before he lost it during the kind of the silver crash. Um, and there was another guy named Edward, S Edward Sanderland who was a barber, who uh, made money as a barber and then invested in other businesses. He was worth $300,000 in the um, 1890s. So a lot, there were a lot of wealthy people here. There was another gentleman out of Georgetown 
and I, I was trying to find, I just couldn't remember his name, but the story is, I think it's Lorenzo something, but um, in Georgetown, they were trying to figure out how to get silver out of that particular rock. It was really difficult to do. So the people in the town hired this uh, white guy to come out who was a world-renowned expert on it uh, to come out and try to figure it out. And after several tries, he just couldn't do it. And he had actually this black assistant, this guy Lorenzo, and the guy Lorenzo says, well, can I give it a try? And he does, and he figures out how to refine um, silver out of that rock and becomes immensely wealthy and moves back east. So there's a lot of stories like that. that I think that feeds into the Colorado being a land of opportunity. Yes, did you have a question? Barbecue, they just honored uh, Daddy Bruce mm -hmm. uh, at, the, at the state capitol, in the capitol, yeah. Yeah. Tuesday, I think it was, and, and his son is still alive also. And right. They honored him. So, and yeah. You know them? I do. So I met the son. Um, so if you don't know the story about Daddy Bruce, Daddy Bruce was a longtime barbecue guy in Denver. Um, so he's from Arkansas. He lands in Arkansas. Oh, did you have something else? Yes. Okay. Also, I just wanted to comment that uh, it's Junction City, New Mexico, I think. Junction, Junction City, New Mexico. There's a Buffalo Soldiers uh, Memorial. Oh, nice. Close to... Uh, they talk about Fort Riley. I went there. I was just driving. Mm -hmm. So I think it's New Mexico. Is it New Mexico or Colorado? Kansas. Kansas? Kansas. That's in Kansas? Kansas. Okay. okay. One of those, yeah. Okay. I, I saw it. It's, very, it's a very nice memorial. It's kind of hidden. You have to kind of drive around and find it. It's kind of like off, you know. Yeah. So I have a Buffalo Soldier cookbook from the wives, but it's from the, the fort they were in in, uh, in, in Arizona uh, that was published in 1920-something. Uh, so yeah, they were, they were very strong presidents throughout the, um, the West. So just to finish talking about Daddy Bruce, so comes from Arkansas, uh, starts a barbecue business in Five Points in Denver in the 1960s, but he was most known for his philanthropy. So every Thanksgiving, he would just have a a uh, free feed for anybody who wanted it. And so uh, he was known for passing out thousands of turkeys. Um, and he does this until his death in the 90s. And then uh, people in the community keep it going yeah, up to the present at, time. He started at 60. 60? He died at 94, yeah. Yeah, he started doing it at age 60, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and actually the street is now, now it's Daddy Bruce, or it's Bruce Randolph Avenue where his restaurant used to be. And his son ran a barbecue joint in Boulder, until maybe 10 years ago? Right. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, strong barbecue legacy. Uh, in and he had, that, he had that same spirit of giving. As a matter of fact, they just had to put some homeless people out of his, his home because they were messing it up. They just were? Let homeless people, just like his dad, let homeless people in, feed anybody who went to the, to the shop, and it's just like that. Yeah, what a legacy of love. Like, he should be in the Barbecue Hall of Fame, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Have a petition? Have a petition, yeah. Well, well, well no, I'll write about them. So. <laughs> <laughs> How many miracles do, do it take? <laughs> How many miracles does it take to be in the barbecue all of Evidently <laughs> <laughs> several. Yeah. I'm sorry, did you have a question? Oh, okay. All right. Um, since we're, oh, yeah. You run your book up for Oprah. <laughs> uh, no. So the question is, like, how do you get to Oprah, right? Because... Uh, I can't tell you how many people have told me, oh, I have a, I, you know, they had some kind of hand to Oprah, and it never, ever <laughs> leads to anything. So now when people say that, I'm like, okay, yeah, just, just let me know. Ellen. She had Oprah on today. <laughs> who, who had Oprah? Had Ellen. Ellen did? Okay, like, how do you get to Ellen, right? <laughs> so, but that, yeah, that's what it's going to take. Um, and I, actually, I'm surprised that, um, well, the, my second book on presidential chefs has gotten some notoriety, and you know, Oprah was in that movie, The Butler. I don't know if you saw The yes. Butler. Yeah. So there's a lot of kind of similar material covered, so I'm surprised Oprah has not called me up and <laughs> <laughs> offered me some kind of deal. Yeah. So let's see. It's just a matter. I just got to keep it out there, because a lot of people still don't know about the book. Um, one of the things that was a blessing is um, my book was nominated for the 2018 NAACP Image Award. Mm -hmm. And uh, for uh, outstanding uh, literary work, nonfiction. So I ended up losing to Dick Gregory. So you know, you're going to lose to somebody, right? Might as well lose to a civil rights legend. Um, but I think with that notoriety, things are going to happen. And also at that ceremony, I got closer to my goal because Halle Berry was in the same building. <laughs> now, I was on the stage, and she, I, you know, I, she was on the stage. I was in the balcony, but I felt a connection. I, I, could, see, I could see it on her face, right? So. No, small steps. <laughs> yeah. Have you um, 
research any information for it, um, African Americans in Boulder. Um, I think I had looked up just a little bit of information. I don't know very much about it, but I was very interested to see that Boulder had uh, a neighborhood where all the African Americans would go to, which was on God Street. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very shocked about that, especially Boulder. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear more about that. So I did, I did do some research. And it's kind of just like whatever came on my radar screen as I was reading these newspapers. But uh, Boulder had an African American church. Yes. And, um, and so did Alamosa. So did Lamar, um, La Hunta. So there were African Americans in a lot of spots. And um, also Otis Jackson, I mentioned, was in Boulder. Um, there was also a, a lot of African American workers who worked at the Stanley. Mm -hmm. And um, he, well into the 1930s and so, they would work there in the summers and it was kind of a resort community. Also Lincoln Hills, if you know about Lincoln Hills yes. outside of Estes Park. Yeah, the that was a well-known resort community. Um, and uh, these, these, there would be ice cream competitions and all kinds of stuff. So I know there's a story to be uncovered there. Um, Can you explain Lincoln Hills? Oh yeah. So <laughs> for those of you who don't know, Lincoln Hills is kind of a community. It was a place for, where African Americans could go for the summer. So you know, there are these communities where people would summer someplace like the Hamptons or whatever. This was almost like the equivalent of that. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was, a, I mean, it still exists to this day. Um, there are multi-generational African American families who have property there. And it was well known. I mean, um, you've got Idlewild <laughs> in Michigan and some other places, but Lincoln Hills was a common um, vacation spot. Where was that? And, and so in Estes Park. No. What, what's that? It's outside of Netherlands. Netherlands? Isn't that, I mean, isn't that part of, no, not the same area? Okay, I'm sorry. Netherlands? All right. Um, I always thought it was close to Estes Park, but Netherlands, okay. Well, what's the county? Is it Boulder County? Yes. Boulder County, okay. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah. It's close. In Colorado, yeah. So this place, uh, is, it goes as early as the 1920s, I believe, but Lincoln Hills, yeah. Um, okay, if you want a, a, just a survey, I would start with The Black West by Lauren, Lauren Katz, K-A-T-Z. And then I would do In Search of the Racial Frontier by Quintar Taylor. I think those are good kind of survey books. And then I think if you start tracking the sources from there, that'll lead you to other things. But those are, those are probably the two best books, I would think. Um, and then from that, if you look at the bibliography, you can get delve in more deeply to other stories. <coughs> and then here. The Black Church in Boulder, one of them, I, well, one, the one that I know of, just celebrated its 110th anniversary. So there's still a black congregation in Boulder? Yes. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Yes. What, do you know which domination it is? Second Baptist. Second Baptist. Second Baptist. Okay. I can connect you with the people who started the church. Yeah. yeah. And you, what anniversary is it? 112, I think it was. 112. So yeah, my church, we are 130. Wow. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of old black congregations here in Colorado. Uh, yeah. So what I was wondering is, since you grew up in Denver, did you learn about any of these amazing folks at all? <laughs> nope. Of course. And my, my parents were from another place, so they weren't connected in that sense to a lot of these stories. So seriously, I didn't know about this stuff until I started going through those newspapers. So you learned about the same, because, you know, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and I got your Harriet Tubman's, and, you know, I got your kind of very standard black history mm -hmm. folks, and they were important, but we never got mm -hmm. uh, any local kind of amazing people who had done things, and you didn't either. Nope. I mean, to the extent we got black history, it was just the national stuff, so there wasn't really any kind of Colorado angle. I mean, the only maybe awakening of it was when we would go to the Bill Pickett Rodeo, with the stock show, right? Mm -hmm. So on Martin Luther King um, Jr. holiday, usually the Bill Pickett Rodeo has a special night mm -hmm. uh, where they showcase African-American rodeo performers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so when you hear the name Bill Pickett, then you're like, oh, there were black cowboys? And then, you know, but I just wasn't that into it at that time, because um, I was more interested in politics and other stuff. So if I had heard about people like Barney Ford or the other, I mean, there were several African-Americans who served in the Colorado Territorial Legislature as well as the state legislature, I think that would have been very interesting. There was actually a, uh, an African-American senatorial candidate in the 1880s. Um, he didn't really have a chance, but uh, you know, just the fact that somebody felt empowered enough to actually put their name on and actually you know, be a part of the process was just amazing to me. So yeah, I just didn't hear any, learn any of this black history. And, I, and, and you know, I didn't start reading this stuff until I was in my 30s. 
I'm like, wow, wow this is cool. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say that it's not just Colorado, that's all states. I'm from yeah. Chicago and yeah. Illinois. I mean, you only hear the national, the same you know, ones, yeah. Right? So yeah. it's very unfortunate that mm -hmm. each state really, you know, mm -hmm. can't just talk about this and for all kids to know that, uh, people of color to know their heritage of that state, that city, so kids can say, wow, they did it way back then, yeah. ancient times, I know I can do it now, <laughs> you know, I'm ancient to my kids, but, you know, so I think it's very important that we provide these histories in our school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So ancient times are in the 1980s, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and today, and today, um, and educators, please weigh in on this. It seems to me that today education is so structured now, um, because of you know standards and all these other things you have to do, that maybe there's really not a lot of room in the curriculum to explore these things. But it's never been a lot of room in the curriculum mm -hmm. right. if we look at it like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, but even before the age of standardized, you know, testing and, and you know you have to. The legislature says you have to learn this. Mm -hmm. I just thought there was more flexibility maybe in the past. It was more like ignorance that they didn't teach it. You're not buying that? <laughs> <laughs> I can just tell by your look. Uh, so I'm just wondering. I, I don't know. Um, but I, I'm hopeful that we could have more in, more of this integrated into curriculums. But I just I wonder if ha teachers are hamstrung to a certain extent. Creative teachers can do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, just a shout out for educators in the room. Uh, anybody heard of Modus Theater? Yes. Mm -hmm. It started in, mm -hmm. in uh, Boulder, and a particular show, which is now on video, um, Rocks, Karma, Arrows, which tells a lot of Colorado history, and particularly Boulder County and Colorado history, through the lens of race and class. Nice. So, and there was enough outcry when the thing was first performed by educators in BBSD that said we need this in the classroom, that we, they remounted it and filmed it, and now there's an educational DVD that you can show. And film. So this is a private theater. It's a nonprofit it's called Modus M M O T U S okay. Modus Theater. Yeah. But it does performances, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. huh. And so you're, are you saying that they make an effort to have diversity in a lot of their programming, their that performances? Is, that okay. is the mission statement to promote community conversation around issues that matter. Okay, I'm gonna look at that. Is it M-O-D-U-S? M-O-T. M-O-T. Okay, I'm gonna look that up. Thank you cool. for that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yes? Was Deerfield on a rail line so it had something like a Harvey House? Yeah, it didn't have a Harvey House, so they had that lunch room, but it was, um, it was actually close to two rail lines. So that's why many thought it was an ideal location. So the, it was close to the Platte River, as well as two rail lines. So if they had just been able to make it through those you know, ag agricultural downturns, I think it would have been, and it was thriving for a long time, but you know, just macroeconomic forces really did them in. But yeah, no, he picked a very good spot. Is it approximately where they set Centennial from uh, James Mishner's books? Oh, that I don't know. I don't know. Those were set in Colorado? Okay. Oh, yeah. mm, I didn't know that. Yeah. There's actually a marker for Deerfield for where it was. I think it's it's about 85, it's mm -hmm. on the way up to Greeley. Mm -hmm. So if you're ever going up there and you see some, a historical marker, stop and read it. <laughs> yeah, I just, I really hope somebody will pour some money into that site and just uh, upgrade the buildings and maybe just talk about the history. Because it's it's, I think it's a rich history. So. Yeah. A few years ago at the county fair here, there was a group that uh, tries to recreate the Buffalo Soldiers. Oh, nice. And unfortunately, I had to be someplace else on the fairgrounds while they were doing their presentation, and they haven't come back. But I think they're out of Denver. Oh, there are a lot I, of. I hope they still exist. Yeah, yeah, no, there are a lot of reenactors around the country. Actually, they have organized clubs, mm -hmm. and so there are a lot of reenactors right now. Um, I, I shouldn't say a lot. There's a, appreciable numbers where they can do performances and other things. So um, I actually ran into one in the airport in Washington D.C. who was heading to a, a convention. And he said there's going to be at least a few hundred there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they're out there doing their thing. And I think they're easy to find. <laughs> yes? You know, a previous speaker here, it's interesting that Deerfield is coming up again because Ed Sealover mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um, talked a couple of weeks or a couple of <coughs> months ago on his book on Colorado excursions with hikes, what, hikes, 
History and pop. His, history and pop. <coughs> and he mentioned deer field. Oh, okay. I'm not an outdoorsy <laughs> guy, so I was <laughs> <laughs> It's about hikes? No, that's good. I'm glad, I'm glad that people are so um, before we end, can I just tell them about becoming a barbecue judge? Yes. Okay. So I got to just tell you because we talk about barbecue so much. So um, what? Because this is the best conversation starter I've ever had. I, I tell people I've worked in the White House, and they're like, "Oh, that's interesting." But you're a barbecue judge. Yeah. So, <laughs> what you have to understand is like much like boxing, there are several sanctioning bodies in barbecue. So I'm a judge in the Kansas City Barbecue Society. So what happens is before a contest, usually the Thursday before, they are looking for judges. So in 2004, I'm thinking about writing this book on soul food, and I figured I'd need to know, learn more about barbecue, because if you go to a lot of soul food restaurants, they usually have a barbecue option on the menu, or if you go to Black Run barbecue joints, they have soul food, right? So I just figured I'd need to know. So lo and behold, I'm reading the Rocky Mountain News in 2004, and there's an ad. Hey, become a barbecue judge at the Adam County Fairgrounds. Oh, okay, cool. So I went in. First thing I realized is I saw my future, because I walked in. There was a a room about the size of this audience. I was the only dude under 250 pounds. <laughs> so that's what I do. Like, it's like, that's my future. So um, I thought they were going to teach me about barbecue, but really it was more about process. So they're like, these are the categories. Pork, which is pork shoulder, beef, brisket, chicken, and pork spare ribs. And then you have a nine-point scale on taste, texture, and appearance. And then they have a sequence. So what they do, and then there's artificial rules. So in the Kansas City Barbecue Society, for example, you can only present your barbecue on three certified greens. Green leaf lettuce, flat leaf parsley, and cilantro. So if you made the best barbecue in the world and you presented it on collard greens, illegal. <laughs> so after they go through all the arbitrary rules, then they bring out barbecue and have you score it just so you can get the hang of it. And then they bring out something purposely illegal just to make sure you catch it. And if you don't, they would say, well, Adrian, you should have noticed that there were not six identifiable pieces in the box, you know, things like that. And after that, you stand up and you take a barbecue oath. Which I'm not going to repeat because it's a sacred thing and I can already tell that some of you are going to mock it. <laughs> And then, a couple weeks later, you get your badge in the mail, which really works well in clubs. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so you get your badge in the mail, and then with that, you can go to any barbecue contest run by that, uh, by that sanctioning body. Here's the bad news. There are way too many barbecue judges now. So every five years, you have to go recertify as a barbecue. When I went to recertify as a judge, when I went to recertify in 2014, they were already at 75,000 judges. Now, when I became a judge, in 2004, I was judge number 6,265, wow. okay? So um, now, you know, they, they have to be past 100,000. So if you don't lock in to become a judge when they first announce it, you're on a waiting list forever. So now I pretty much only do celebrity judging. We just need uh, more barbecue. We need more barbecue. Yeah, there you go. So, um, so that's how you become a barbecue judge. So I, I highly endorse it. And um, much like wine, after you take your barbecue, you spit it out. No, I'm just kidding. What you do is uh, they allow you actually to bring coolers. So the, the experienced barbecue judges know that you only take a bite and then you put it in a sandwich bag and put it in a cooler. Because if you eat all of that food that they put in front of you, you're going to get a pound and a half of meat in 90 minutes. Right? So the experienced barbecue judges know to take it slow. So thank you so much. You guys were great. What well, appreciate you Favorite presences we have. Um, anyways, we are a little over time, but that's okay. Um, we can be out here until nine, and Adrian's going to come back here to this table and sell books and talk to you guys and give him, um, give you his autograph. So be sure to stop by. Thanks again for coming. And I'm happy to autograph your book. Like I couldn't have done it without you. However you want. <laughs> 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 <